Hey everyone, welcome back to our walking tour video. Today we are back in South Wales and are finally getting the chance to visit somewhere we've had pinned on the map for a while now. Join us for a walk back in time around a magnificent medieval palace that was set in the smallest city in Britain. In the late 6th century, St David established a monastery here on the southwestern tip of the Pembrokeshire Peninsula. Over the following centuries, David's monastery was a centre for training missionary monks who travelled throughout Wales, Ireland, and southwest England. After David's death, his shrine became a popular place for pilgrimage. By the 11th century, St David's had grown into a very important place of worship and a scholarship centre, despite being plundered repeatedly by Viking invasions. Prior to the arrival of the Normans in the 11th century, the original monastery was built earlier in the 6th century. It had been ransacked on over 10 different occasions by the Norse raiders. But the most serious threat to the monastery was not from the Norse, but from the Norman invaders who came by land following the Norman conquest of England in 1066. The Normans gradually conquered southern Wales and established their own bishops to replace the Welsh. One of the first buildings and earliest surviving rooms on the site is the West Range, dated back to around the early 13th century. It is long, dark and narrow with tall gable ends. It was later modified by Henry Gower to provide lodgings. As we walked up the beautiful staircase, we entered into the great chapel on the first floor, directly ahead in the southern range and beyond the elaborate porch. This is one of two chapels on the site, but this great chapel was more used for important guests, whereas the bishop and the staff were able to use the bishop's chapel that was held next to the gatehouse. We wandered inside the great chamber, which would have once served as a bedroom and a sitting room, mainly for your more important guests. It was incredibly sized and alongside the great grand hall, with Gower's beautiful and ornate rose window. It's so impressive that it stood the test of time and it looks immaculate still. This south range was built mainly for entertaining guests, where feasting was a powerful symbol of wealth and status. Musicians were also drawn in and they were essential to a medieval feast that they could also earn an honest and decent living by travelling from place to place. The hall was more than likely heated by a fireplace with the smoke escaping through a vent in the roof. The long windowless wall was ideal for decorated tapestries and just to the side a large privy is housed before we climb the steep staircase that has wonderful views over the palace and the great chamber. It's really beautiful to see. Why the need for the battlements overlooking the great hall and the chamber is unknown, but it's a really cool feature that it was built there. Both sets of the chambers were built at first floor level above vaulted undergrowths and entered by elaborate porches. The crowning glory, however, was still the distinctive chequered arcaded fortifications which, although faded, still has the effect of unifying the group of buildings.
1280, Bishop Thomas Beck began an ambitious programme of building beside the cathedral. Though Bishop Beck greatly enhanced the early Norman palace, it was down to a later bishop, Henry de Gower, who created the palace that we see today. It was Gower who added a great grand hall to the site. Its most impressive and a notable piece of his work was the circular rose window that's set to the east. His work also included building a chapel and a private suite of apartments. He also created the grand entrance gate that is one of the more striking features of the palace. The Bishop of St David's was also a Lord Marcher, responsible for keeping the peace and acting as a military leader if the need ever arose. Lord Marchers were trusted allies of the English monarch and in return for their military role they were given surprising powers in their regions. So the Bishop had the right to hold weekly markets and annual fairs on his estates. These tolls from the markets and fairs were a major source of income and funded the palace. The bishops only really visited St David's on special occasions. This was more than likely just to celebrate the more important religious feasts, such as Easter and Christmas. Other times, they would more than likely meet at Lamphy Bishop's Palace, that sits around 20 miles away from here. The bishops had also sat in the House of Lords in London so they regularly spent time in the capital too. A single ingeniously designed kitchen was built by Bishop Gower that served both parts of this double palace that was created. A huge fireplace, a sluice and bread oven can be seen, as well as access to the storage rooms below. It's right next to the Great Hall, which of course is a perfect placement for the kitchen to be. Inside of the Bishop's Hall would have been where the Bishop would have spent a lot of time, with his many official duties that had to be sorted, and between running his own estates, the Bishops needed the help from other important officials. They were known as the Bailiff and the Summoner. The Bailiff was responsible for collecting taxes and kept up to date with estate accounts, whereas the Summoner worked for the court. He could impose fines for bad behaviour and issued summons to appear before the bishop. All of the stones that were used to build the palace were obtained locally. The walls are built with rubble stone from the nearby quarry and the cliffs too. They were originally covered with a lime render which provided a smooth finish and most importantly it protected the stone from erosion. But over time the render had fallen away, leaving it vulnerable to weathering. The wealth of the decorative stonework too was vulnerable, which is why some of the surfaces are flaky or destroyed. There are around 150 different decorated corbels at roof level, which show off animals and human faces 
as well as elaborate carvings surrounding the main doorways. These are always fantastic to try and look out for. The undercrofts hold a display of the palace's construction and the history of all of the bishops. They were mainly used for storage spaces in this massive palace, but it was also possible that it would have provided accommodation for servants. We've not filmed under here, so it gives you a chance to go and visit for yourself and experience and take in all of the history of the palace. The bishops established a grand residence immediately beside the cathedral. But the Normans were no fools. They realised that St David's was vulnerable to attack by sea. They built a Mott and Bailey fortification on the site, but this was later abandoned in favour of an encircling stone wall around the cathedral and a bishop's palace. The East Wing would have been where the bishop would have slept when he stayed here, and it was almost the only place in the entire complex that he could enjoy some privacy without being hassled. What remains are full sections of the walls of pre-Gothic Romanesque arches and gargoyles, with unique checkerboard patterns outlining the Great Hall, the bishop's solar and the quite impressively massive bishop's bedroom looking out onto the cathedral. The site is now in the care of Caddy and is often used for open air performances and I can definitely see why. It would be so wonderful to watch a show here but the combination of the cathedral and the palace really do make St David's a wonderful historic treat to get lost in. St David's is actually the smallest city in Britain with a population of just 1600 residents. It's absolutely lovely to have a wander around with the beautiful cathedral attached to the palace and the pastel painted cottages and pubs that surround it. So we really hope you've enjoyed our tour today and have enjoyed walking around with us too. If so, please hit that like button and why not consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. We want to say a huge thank you to our Patreons and thank you so much for watching. Till next time.